Thank you and welcome to this uh, very important day. Of course, uh, we are still as a nation in a period of mourning about the events in Newtown and all we can say today I think is that we hope that this venture that we are talking about will make some contribution to making sure that never happens again. Uh, we celebrate an extraordinary gift today from Mort Zuckerman for the Mind Brain Behavior Institute. Uh, this is a project that goes back a decade. It is something that we have taken on as part of our effort at Columbia to build a new campus. 100 years ago, Columbia was out of space and moved from Midtown to what is here with almost the same amount of acres that we now have in Manhattanville, 17 acres here on Morningside Heights. This was a project of almost unimaginable proportions, and the person who was there at the beginning to help us see it through was the mayor, Michael Bloomberg, who is with us today. This is a campus that will unfold over many decades, and this is Columbia's future. And at that time, in trying to think about what would be the lead institutional and academic structure and enterprise that we would have in Manhattanville, we asked, and I asked, the three great neuroscientists here, Eric Kandel and Richard Axel and Tom Jessel, if they would lead the effort to create an interdisciplinary mind-brain behavior institute that would focus on trying to bring together people from all over the university, from virtually every single field, to think about the brain and the mind and society. They undertook that at a time when it wasn't at all clear uh, that this could happen. The next thing that happened that was so important was that Don Green, wife of Jerome L. Green, graduate of the college and the law school, committed a very large sum of uh, money to help build the science center that would house the center of the mind-brain behavior, the heart of the mind-brain behavior institute. That gift was a tremendous boost to our efforts. And here today is Chris McInerney, daughter of Don Green and head of the Jerome L. Green Foundation. And I'd like her to stand so that we can thank her and her mother. <laughs> Renzo Piano is our master architect and the architect of the building, the Green Science uh, Center. And we are off to the point where just three and a half years from now, that will open and the Mind Brain Behavior Institute will be housed there. Now we have this fantastic gift from Mort Zuckerman uh, to name the institute and to endow it. And you have to understand that in the academic world, to have that permanence, to have that sense of available resources, to recruit faculty, to support graduate students, to help undergraduate students, to help all of us realize the academic potential of this incredible field of neuroscience and everything that it represents in the possibilities of curing disease and better understanding the mind. This gift makes that possible. As I like to say, we all think about the mind, we all think about the brain, not just at the molecular level or the neuron level, but those of us who try to understand human behavior uh, at any level. And so all of us are part of this institute. And when it finally is open in three and a half years, of course the institute is already underway with some great additions to our faculty. When it is uh, opened in the Green Science Center in three and a half years from now. There will be 65 faculty and laboratories, 
and over a thousand scientists and faculty throughout the institution working in this incredibly important area. So let me now uh, introduce, uh, bring to the podium the mayor. Again, there's so many things to say about Mike Bloomberg, but here in this room, at this moment, the most important thing to say is that he was there at the beginning, and when the university needed space to do the things that we can do, uh, he and his colleagues, his team, were there to help support us and make this a reality. Mayor Bloomberg. Lee, thank you. Let me just start out by congratulating Mort uh, once again. I had the chance to do that when he called and backstage. Um, there are a few things, a few people that are lucky enough to have the wherewithal to change the world. And unfortunately, fewer of them who actually try to do it. Uh, Mort has always been one of those who uh, thought that we can have a better place for our children and uh, for our grandchildren. And rather than just talk about it, he has been out there doing something. And this is just another example of his generosity, but also of his understanding of what changes society and what kind of responsibility we have to our academic institutions to further man's body of knowledge. I can't stay for the full conference today. After this event, I'll be heading back to City Hall to stand with those who have personally been affected by gun violence and will launch a new push to get Washington to act. What happened in Connecticut last Friday really was a national tragedy. It happens again and again and again, uh, but we can't allow it to pass without doing something this time to stop the epidemic of gun violence in our country. And I know today's honored guests feel exactly the same way. Uh, it is a pleasure to join the Columbia community. Uh, as I point out, another school that I never would have gotten into, <laughs> although uh, my sister has a Columbia graduate degree, my girlfriend has a, two Columbia graduate degrees, and Lee has invited me for coffee one time. <laughs> uh, but uh, praising Mort is easy to do. His extraordinary generous gift is completely characteristic of him, and it shows uh, so much about what he really is. It displays I, th displays, I think, the amazing breadth of interest and ceaseless curiosity that makes him such a great publisher. It illustrates his understanding that every audience in uh, knowledge today, every advance in knowledge today really does draw in research across the broad range of disciplines. And it reflects, I think, the great humanitarian spirit that marks him as one of New York's truly indispensable citizens. Uh, today's announcement is also personally, personally gratifying for two reasons. First, I was happy to learn that Mort's interest in neuroscience was sparked by the Brain Series discussion on the Charlie Rose Show. They're co-hosted by one of Columbia's Nobel laureates, Eric Kandel, and I should mention uh, immodestly broadcast on Bloomberg Television, which I hope that Charlie doesn't ask for a raise. And uh, second, I want to point out that the research done by this institute will be supported in part by the new Institute for Data Sciences and Engineering that our administration is helping Columbia establish. And I think that just underscores again how critically important our support is for expanding the applied sciences here and at other, cam other campuses in our city. They will more than double the number of engineering faculty and graduate students in our city. And like the institute that Mort is endowing, uh, will help uh, keep New York on the leading edge of exciting scientific breakthroughs and create the kind of economy we want for our children and grandchildren. And it will really will put us at the forefront of the knowledge-based community around the world. Um, what your gift is going to enable scientists who may not even have been born yet to experience the thrill of discovery. It is going to contribute to the conquest of neurological and psychiatric dis disorders and liberation from the suffering that they create, and even perhaps point us towards greater insights about the kind of violent mental demons that were unleashed in Connecticut last Friday. So on behalf of future generations of New Yorkers and also on behalf of all of us here today, I just wanted to personally say thank you. I don't know how many things in your life other than your kids you will get as much pleasure out of, but every time you hear about this, you're gonna have a smile on your face. And just before you turn out the lights at night and you look in the mirror, you really do have every reason to smile. God bless everyone and enjoy. Thank you, Mayor.
Mort Zuckerman has had a career of extraordinary accomplishment and success, from the business of real estate to the role of publisher, columnist, and insightful commentator on our civic and political life. Today, we admire him especially for his embrace of this university and the commitment he's made to the brilliant scholars here today and generations to come, who will, because of him, accomplish great things at Columbia's Mortimer B. Zuckerman Mind, Brain, Behavior Institute. Mort. Thank you, uh, President Bollinger. Thank you, Mayor Bloomberg. And thank you to this extraordinary academic community for allowing me to become part of this remarkable effort uh, with these outstanding scholars. This is almost an unimaginable moment for me, as I'm sure it would have been for any first-generation immigrant such as myself. My improbable journey is yet another American story of an immigrant participating in the American dream. I feel blessed to have had the chance to live in America, at first with few friends and no family, and to have found so many places where a stranger could find acceptance, opportunity, and indeed success. If I had back then imagined that I would be standing here with the agenda of this morning, um, it would have seemed delusional to put it in terms appropriate for a form on the behavior of the brain. Or as I usually put it, I bet the Lord is as my American journey began with the opportunities attendant uh, in going to great academic institu institutions, the Wharton School and the Harvard Law School. When I finished my studies, I had a great education and the certain knowledge that the practice of law was not for me. My career instead followed my passion and en endless fascination with cities and their capacity to develop and accommodate people of all varieties. So after law school, I looked to urban real estate and was fortunate to find a place that welcomed me in the form of a Boston real estate firm called Cabot, Cabot & Forbes. I interviewed with the CEO, a wonderful man named Jerry Blakely. We hit it off, and he offered me a job for 6750 bucks, more money than I could have ever imagined earning. I was too dumbfounded to speak, and before I could accept and thank him, he said, okay, I'll up the salary to $7,750. That was the day when I learned an important lesson. You can do some of your best negotiating by keeping your mouth shut. Uh, for the next seven years, I enjoyed a wonderful career there. And in 1969, I started my own firm called Boston Properties. and was joined a year later in a partnership with a wonderful colleague and dear friend, Ed Lindy. We shared a passion for cities and for high quality, great design. That enabled us to develop a series of wonderful properties, including landmark buildings in Boston, Cambridge, New York, Washington, and San Francisco. It also enabled me to teach urban design at Harvard, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, for 11 years. In 1987, we entered the city of New York and its market, which for me was the epitome of what a city should be. Maybe that is why growing up in Canada, I spent so much time reading about the city and what was happening there. The fascination with New York City, in my case, took an entertaining turn when I was 12. My parents had a credit account at the Edison Hotel in Times Square. Once while they were on their annual winter trip in Florida, my father being unable to handle the cold winters in Montreal, I made a reservation pretending to be representing my father. I told them that his son would be arriving first and to accommodate him at the hotel. I then took the train by myself from Montreal to New York and spent four days walking up and down the streets of New York City in total fascination. I will leave it to your imagination what the reaction of my parents was when they found out who had been running up bills on their New York hotel account. But it was worth it. My love of cities and my experience in real estate opened up new vistas for me. I could appreciate firsthand the public information and public policy and how it could impact communities and people's lives. 
Since my other great passion during my teenage years was journalism and public policy, I began to enter the world through that media, that world through the media, first with regional newspapers, then the Atlantic Monthly, then a startup magazine covering the dot-com world called Fast Company, and eventually, in the 1980s, U.S. News and World Report. There, I took advantage of my very close relationship with the magazine's new editor-in-chief, Mort Zuckerman, and began writing the editorials and experienced both the joys and the hard knocks that come with it. It turned out to be a wonderful experience and a tremendous education, not to mention a platform from which I could participate in public affairs. Then in the 1990s, I was lucky enough to become the publisher of the New York Daily News, a great New York institution that I could not be more proud of. So as you can see, this country and this city have been wonderful to me. The capacity to give something back in the hope of making a difference in a country that I love and that has been so generous to me is thus a great privilege. One only needs to look at our mayor, Michael Bloomberg, to see a great example of this principle in action. Almost no one has returned more to this city and indeed to the nation. Almost no one has done as much in both public service and philanthropy. The world would be a better place if there were more like him. Incidentally, I treasure the fact that the New York Daily News was the only major newspaper to endorse him the first time he ran. It was the right call, and I'm proud of the role we played in his election. As to specific motivation, Eric Kandel is the visionary who convinced me that we stand at the edge of a new era of understanding the human mind. A couple of years ago, my very close friend Joel Klein, who is here today, suggested I might be interested in Eric's work. We visited his lab, and I learned about his groundbreaking research. Of course, he was fascinating, charming, and brilliant. What is that line about, he's the most uh, intelligent man I've ever spoken to or spoke with since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. He explained that for the first time we have the technology to measure extensively the real effects of drugs and treatment on the brain that would dramatically increase our capacity to deal with that very complicated part of our anatomy. It was clear that there is so much to learn and so much potential from this research that I felt inspired and compelled to support the effort. Eric, Richard Axel, and Tom Jessel will be talking about this in a few minutes. I'm sure that listening to them talk about their work and their hopes will underscore why I made this commitment more than anything that I could say myself. I also want to thank and congratulate President Lee Bollinger. He's done a remarkable job of leading this wonderful institution and keeping it at the forefront of global academic innovation and making Columbia a home for brilliant, brilliant scholars that you are about to hear from who are committed to extending the boundaries of knowledge that is characteristic of this great university. Who could not be motivated by the potential benefits in this field of scientific research? Human progress must not stop, not when we can honor, support, and further advance the uh, work of these great researchers who demonstrate that our country still leads the world as a beacon of learning, opportunity, hope, and achievement. I'm just thrilled to be a part of this bold and ambitious research initiative. I'm thrilled that my daughter Abigail is here to share this moment, and she has promised to explain it to her three-year-old sister. I'm thrilled that my two sisters, Carmen and Pauline, have also joined me. So I thank you all very, very much for giving me this opportunity and privilege, and I wish you all the best.